delighted you could be with us this evening. We have as our guest tonight uh, Sylvan Suskin, retiring professor of musicology at the Oberlin Conservatory. Has been on the faculty 33 years, is that correct? And looks none the worse the wear for it. Uh, we're delighted that he could be with us tonight. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Let me say a bit about him. Uh, you have your BA from City College, uh, New York, MA and PhD, Yale. And I might add, his son just graduated from Yale also. So, did your yes. daughter also? No. No, no. She went to Tufts. And he had a Fulbright Award in 1965 and 66. What country did you go to? France. France. And he did a three-year stint as a member of the committee of the college board to develop advanced placement examinations in music. That was 1986, I believe, 89. He taught at City College at Yale before coming to Oberlin. Uh, no, I'm sorry. And then you went to Yale and taught, didn't you, for a little bit? I left the free off them. And then came here in 1968. And from 1971 to 1974, he did a stint as associate dean of the conservatory. And that, of course, was at an interesting time in, in the sure was. beginning of the 70s, wasn't it? Exactly. And he retires this year after 33 years of distinguished service uh, to the conservatory. And as I say, we're so glad you're here. Just great. Thanks tell for us, inviting me. Tell us about where you grew up. Uh, I was born in Belgium mm -hmm. uh, just before the war, the Second World War. And so my parents left at mm -hmm. the beginning of the war and uh, went to live in first in southern France and then uh, to Cuba for five oh, years. Cuba. Mm -hmm. Yes, I lived in Cuba during the mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, we came to the United States and I basically was brought up in, in, in uh, New York City. New York City. Yes. And, and uh, was music important in your family? Um, it was nothing professional. My parents were not trained in any, or, or anyone else in the family mm -hmm. that I know of. Uh, the immediate family was trained in music. Uh, but they loved music, and it was always on in the house. In those days, of course, it was on radio or 78 RPMs. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people now know. My students don't know what a 78 RPM mm -hmm. is. But... Um, well, you should uh, call them dinner plays. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and and um, so I would... Let me just tell you the story about me and music, because my parents told me the, the earliest um, recollection they have of me and music is, I can't remember this, but sitting on the potty <laughs> when I was a, you know, one and a half, two year old, mm -hmm. singing arias for Migoletto by Verdi. Mm -hmm. I must have heard it on the, on the radio, and I just had a good musical ear, picked it up, and started singing. And of course, everybody had to come and watch. I, mm -hmm. I demanded people to come and watch mm -hmm. while I was there. Um, mm -hmm. A born teacher. A born and teacher. Right at them. Exactly. That, that is amazing. <laughs> from, uh, from the commode to the conservatory. Yes. 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 Perhaps we won't exactly. probe that any more deeply, <laughs> but I think that's right. an interesting uh, uh, right. jump in, in, in your life. And then I, I did not start really studying music early, and that is something that uh, I think you'll get to this in a mm -hmm. later question, probably about um, my, my history as a musician. Uh, and that's too bad because I think I, you know, I was lucky to be a talented musician. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, because of of the war and the ability of of instruments and all that. I didn't start piano until I was in my early teens, oh. I think thirteen. Mm -hmm. And so I really came to music quite late, although I constantly listened to it. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and you, uh, the choice of City College was because you were in New York? Is that it, because I was in New York, because mm -hmm. it was at that time a very fine school, one of the better mm -hmm. schools, and because it was free. Mm -hmm. And then um, you, what uh, drew you to Yale? Um, well, if, if, before I answer that, okay. let me go back, because I, was, I started in, in City College as a biochemistry major. Oh, really? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in the second year, I, I had problems with my eyesight. I couldn't see things through the microscope. Uh, so uh, that was not obviously for me, sciences. You didn't want to cause uh, explosions uh, exactly. in the lab or anything of exactly. that sort. So the question was what to do, what to do, just like most young people mm -hmm. wondering what to do. What do you really love? So it was the night of November 7th, one of the most important moments in my life, 3 a.m., I couldn't sleep, 
What are you going to do with your life, Sylvan? Um, the light bulb. What do you really love? You love music. And you were wanted to teach anyway, even if you would go into chem or chemistry. So why not teach music? Fine. So I decided I was going to go into music. The next day I went to see the chairman of the music department who immediately tried to dissuade me because he said, you don't have enough background, you don't know enough and all that. And I, he said, but all right, start. Take courses and see how it develops. And the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. I, I, I just was totally taken by this. Uh, couldn't st have enough of it, uh, of, of listening and reading and studying about it. So then at uh, at the end, since I was started so late, it was too late really to develop uh, what I really had hoped to for a long time to be. I was, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a closet conductor, right? I would have loved to have been a conductor. I had some experience with it, but my ear had just not been developed enough to do it at the level of the professional level that I would have wanted to do it at. So what else to do in music? And I enjoyed very much the study of, of musicology, of, of music history, and those areas. So Yale, I, I had a friend who was a st uh, friend of the family who was a student at Yale. And this young lady said, why don't you apply to Yale? Mm -hmm. And of course, Yale was one of these magical names. It was a very famous uh, music department mm -hmm. in, in addition to everything else. So I just applied. and. Lo and behold, I was accepted. <laughs> right, wonderful. Yes. Uh, you came to Rome in 1968. How did that come about? Uh, it was the year that I was, I, I had just uh, uh, f been finishing my dissertation and I was up for a job. And in my field, uh, already from the 60s through the now, uh, just until very recently, it was extremely difficult to get a good job in the field. There are very few jobs for many, many people looking. And uh, so I was just, it, it's a very simple, mundane type of story. I, I, I was in the hall, the chairman of the music uh, department came to me and said, I have just received a call from Richard Murphy, mm -hmm. who was my predecessor. Mm -hmm. My at, neighbor at, down at, the street. Right, at, mm -hmm. at Oberlin, who uh, asking, do you ha we need a new person. Do you ha have someone you can recommend? So he asked, so my teacher asked me, uh, would you like me to, give you a name. And of course I said yes. How can you say no? Uh, and so uh, the next thing, uh, I was invited for an interview. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, to, he said, would you like me to give your name to Oberlin? And I had heard of Oberlin, but I had no idea really what it was. I knew it was, there was a music, good music school there, but I even thought it was in New Hampshire. I had no idea it was <laughs> in, in Ohio. <laughs> So well, well, luckily you straightened that out before you came oh, to the interview. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> still see you wandering around the, the mountains there in uh, uh, yeah, right. New Hampshire looking for Oberlin all these years. <laughs> uh, you've been here 33 great years. Uh, let me ask you two or three questions to sort of reflect on that. Uh, has the conservatory changed much over these 33 years? I think the answer is both yes and no, mm -hmm. like for so many questions mm -hmm. one can. Um, in, in a certain way, the basic mission of the conservatory has not changed. The sense of having a school of very high standards, both in performance and in, in, and in the academic areas, and the whole question of the relationship to the con college and the mm -hmm. special nature of this place. Uh, from that point of view, the basic concept of what our students should come out with, that is a broad education as well as a very focused professional goal education, that was there when I came and that is still there. The differences are in the, the, the gradual changes in curriculum, mm -hmm. the broadening of the curriculum, uh, the interest for example in, in the last 15-20 years in the increasing interest in new music. Mm -hmm both faculty and students being much more involved than they were when I first came. When I first came here, there were very few public performances uh, of new music, mm -hmm. of music since 1950, mm -hmm. post-World War II, uh, as most people were pretty much turned off to a lot of that kind of music. But gradually, this has changed, as the music itself has evolved, and the more and more young people are very much involved to the point that 
they find it, many of them find it more congenial or easier. Or they, they, they identify with new music more easily than with very old music. And that's a real change, mm -hmm. the attitude of the students. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's a bit harder even to get them truly excited about, about the 18th century and the music of Mozart, say, to really get them to understand the subtleties than um, the new music. But that's, and then, of course, there have been new programs like the jazz program and all that that have evolved. Through and, of course, and, of course, you have the double degree now more and more, don't you? Yes, we had the double degree, and that is, I mean, I think, uh, I can't say enough that's fantastic about the double degree. And probably Those the students are the finest students, mm -hmm. generally. You know, they're, they're very smart, they're hardworking, they're, and it's hard, you know. Oh, yes. I mean, to be in physics and, and, and music and have to spend hours in the practice room and all that, I, I, I take my hats off to these kids. Yeah. And I gather the relationship is pretty good between the College of Arts and Sciences and the Conservatory, for the most part, cooperating uh, and so forth. Yeah, uh, you know, it, there's the... the it, it depends on who you talk about. Yeah. You know, some yeah, of sure. you know, and, and, and questions of financial things mm. come into effect here. By and large, of course, from the student point of view, the students in the college often come to Oberlin because they want to, They know about the conservatory. They take courses there and all that. And the co conservatory students are expected and have to take courses in the college. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's great for the mixture uh, that they have socially. Uh, many college students get to know about music through their roommates maybe who may be oh. conservatory mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the college has always tried to push for a greater integration and more, you know, the, the, the conservatory is a professional school and it has a very different orientation from, from uh, by many of the teachers there and students from the broader liberal arts education mm -hmm. of the college. And so there are sometimes there's a, pro you know, there for the college people to really understand what the training of a com musician is, is hard, and, and many of the musicians want to concentrate so much and need to on becoming professionals that there isn't, they do not do enough with the college. And uh, Nancy Dye, the present president, uh, uh, is trying to even improve that, as, as is Dean Dodson of mm -hmm. the conservatory. Mm -hmm. And I think in the next few years there's going to be more and more of, of co new courses and more uh, exchanges in the arts uh, with the conservatory. Mm -hmm. So that bodes very well Great. for the institution. Let me ask, uh, uh, one of the things that I think we, any of us at Oberlin who pay attention very much, know that the talent and level, and the brightness of conservatory students is generally very, very high. Um, has that changed any over the years? I've, I've heard people say that they thought the students were even more and more talented as they came in. I think from a quest point, well, there, we've always had very talented students. You know, in, in, a, in, a, in a community as large as the conservatory of, you know, four, five hundred, between five and six hundred students, you're always going to get some incredible talents mm -hmm. that really are. And then all the way, you know, people, everybody has some talent. You can't get into the conservatory without, without the abilities to get in and, you know, to perform. Um, but so there's always been a core of really fine students. I think, though, that in the last decade, um, partially as a result, I may say, of Fred Starr and his, in, his goal, together with the dean of the conservatory, to build up the, 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 in, the reputation of the conservatory mm -hmm. and, and, and the level, uh, in general, of the whole school uh, by providing more money, uh, hiring you know, faculty of, mm -hmm. of renown and all that, that this has attracted more uh, top-notch students in performance. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you ask that question because, yes, as talents in music go, there are more top-notch talents. Mm -hmm. in, but from the other point of the students who come in, uh, in general, with the knowledge that they have of everything else, of their background in education, there, I would say, it is not quite as good as it was 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. but that is a national problem edu mm -hmm. of education in the high schools and whatever. You know? So part of the challenge is to not discourage this talent, but bring the other level up uh, and then exactly. have them both go. Exactly. That sort of, exactly. which is a challenge. And one of the things that I, who have to teach the introductory courses at the very beginning that they come, 
it, it is a challenge to have students, some of whom come from very educated uh, musical families, New York City, know a lot of music, and then you have somebody who comes from some, you know, some small town where he was the uh, leading clarinetist in the, in the band, who has great, good musical talent, but has never heard a Beethoven symphony. Mm -hmm. And then comes to Oberlin, and how do you then, you know, do courses that are uh, of interest to, mm -hmm. to both? That leads to my next question. Do you teach in t year 2001 the way you did in 1968? Again, I, I, again, <laughs> the, again, the answer is yes and no. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, I think that my, the standards that I set for myself as to what I would like to do have not really changed. Mm -hmm. And the, my, my, ma my personal manner of teaching, in which I feel I, am, I do my best work, is lecturing mm -hmm. rather than discussion. And since I have most of my classes are very large classes, the introductory mm -hmm. courses are mm -hmm. uh, a couple Because all the freshmen have to take your course. All of them they? have to take it, yes. And so I have, you know, about uh, between 180 and 200 students. And obviously one cannot have conversations that, plus the fact that there's, they come there knowing so little, it's very hard before you learn some basic information to have a conversation mm -hmm. at a high enough level to make, to make it truly I interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that, but I even have found that for myself, even at the m a more advanced courses, that I function best if I lecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I write out my lectures, I try not to read them too much, you know, I make it seem to it, but it's a lot of work to really plan everything very carefully. But I find that I come across better than that than if I have a discussion. Mm. I've tried the discussion, and for me, it doesn't really work. So on that scale, yes, um, it's the same. Pretty much my manner, uh, you know, my, my general format of in the, in the classrooms and, and even outside. But um, obviously, the material changes with time, with all the scholarship and books and everything else that's been done in the last few years. Uh, I have to keep up. And all the genres of music coming and all in. The that genres there coming in. So there's, yes. there's an expansion. And of course, when you think of what new music was in up to 68 and how much has come up since then, obviously you have to bring that into the, into the discussion. Uh, sort of tying into that is the challenge, I assume it must be, to balance scholarship as a faculty member, particularly in something like musicology, and also teaching. And this must be true through the arts and sciences, too. Absolutely. Uh, do this you find is, that, is that uh, Yeah, well, this has been a delicate issue, and uh, not only at Oberlin, it's across all of academia, uh, the whole, I mean, this leads to the, those big questions of publish and peri or perish, and the pressures on faculty members, especially young faculty members, to produce scholarly work, and yet to maintain high teaching standards. Uh, Oberlin, what, what really I liked at Oberlin from the very beginning is that I was encouraged uh, both, uh, you know, with raises as well as, as just uh, the, by, by the nature of the institution to focus a lot of attention on, on teaching. Mm -hmm. if, if one is not a good teacher at Oberlin and publishes a dozen books, you, cannot, you won't stay at Oberlin. Mm -hmm. It's not like a major university. You have to be uh, at a certain level of teaching. So everyone is, is here, I think, I mean, all, everyone. Most people are, I think, fine teachers. Mm -hmm. My own outlook was, although I was trained as a scholar and I, have, I f think of myself as a scholar, I have not published very much. Mm -hmm. Because what I have tried to do is to constantly stay with the field and bring in new information into my courses, constantly revise my courses, update them, and given that I write out these lectures and they take a tremendous amount of time and effort to do, uh, I have personally, for me, I have minimized the scholarly aspect. Mm -hmm. I've done some, but not a lot. Uh, a lot of, uh, I would say most people in academia and especially in the college here would say that one cannot really be even a great teacher without, have, without doing scholarship. So there is this, this tremendous pressure to find the time to do the original scholarship which has to be you know, at the highest level of, of, of one's discipline, mm -hmm. uh, and yet 
to try to maintain interesting courses for undergraduates since we are just an undergraduate school. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to teach in a graduate school because you can have students do all kinds of seminars and you know, mm -hmm. present papers. But here when you have to impart information at a certain, you know, it's, it demands a lot. We're going to take a break in a moment. Believe it or not, we're at that point. Wow. But let me ask one question before we do that. I notice that you are listed officially as professor of musicology. How do you define musicology? Oh, wow. That's, okay, musicology in, in one sentence, musicology is the academic study, scholarly study of music. Okay. Now, that involves a tremendous amount of it things. Could, it could mean music history plus other things. It could mean music history and, and music theory is, Musicologists considered music theory as a, a, a branch of mm -hmm. the scholarly study of music, mm -hmm. but but the scholarly study of music in uh, music history involves so many things. It's a tremendous. It's this. It's the basically the study of the development of musical style through time, and by doing analysis of music and by trying to understand the context in which it was written, the historical context of any given period why certain music was written a certain way, what were the ideas behind it, how people listened, how the music was accepted. Uh, it's, it's a very common, and then look at original manuscripts and try to figure out exactly mm -hmm. what did the composer intend, how was the music performed in those days, the whole question of historical performance, you know, which has been such a big thing in the last uh, generation. So uh, it's a tremendous study, but at the core is to try to understand how music developed and look at individual pieces of music and try to analyze them and make sense out of what makes this music so interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a break. We'll be back in about a minute and continue with our fascinating interview. No sooner does something happen than the TV cameras are there covering it. There before almost anyone else. Almost. Please support the American Red Cross. The need is real. The time is now. Help can't wait. Thank you for staying with us as we have this great interview with Professor Suskin of the Conservatory of Music. The next question I'd like to ask you is sort of a broad one. Uh, music is evolving. And what I mean by that is that um, we're getting into things like electronic music. We're getting into different tones of music. Now here, I'm not a musician, so I'm in very shaky well, ground computer. here. Computer. Computer things and so forth. And uh, how, how does one teach or approach, let's say, uh, in, in your introductory classes, you've got the, you've got the Baroque, you've got the pre-Baroque, you've got the Baroque, you've got the Romantic, but then all of a sudden you've, you've got electronic music and other things. And the, Postmodern, if that's the right yes. term. Well, how do, of course, how do you the 20th century? Yes, yeah, 20th century. How, century. how do you bring that all together? You know? Bring it all together and make it make sense. Is there a theme? Let's let's put it this way: Is there a, a theme through all of this? Uh, yeah. I, well, one can take different approaches. My point that I try to make at the very beginning of of my course is that it doesn't really matter at a, which s period of music history you are studying. Any one of them can be fascinating. Mm -hmm. And any one of them can be approached from similar or somewhat different uh, points of view. 
The idea is to study the music of the time using all the approaches that one can uh, have developed in scholarship to understand why music is the way it is at a given time, how a composer thinks, and what was the prevailing style of music at that time. And the basic concept of the approach to these things makes is the same whether you're talking about the medieval times as 20th century. The biggest problem really is the music of today, mm -hmm. that is of the last generation or even the last 15, 20 years because we do not yet have the distance of history to, to, to have a critical distance uh, to, to, to come to try to understand, because the styles are so new. And nowadays, in our time, there are so many different styles, the whole concept of pluralism and multiculturalism and all that, and all these factors that come in from, from vernacular popular music and musics from around the world, and all of this new electronic music, computer music, and, and still using uh, regular instruments mm -hmm. and uh, traditional instruments. And there are all these different approaches, and it is very difficult to, to have a critical opinion of this because it's just like in, if I go back, for instance, in time when Beethoven wrote his third symphony, he was totally lambasted and attacked for it, for being so new and crazy. He was the avant-garde. Nobody understood it. Uh, mm -hmm. except a few close friends. And so nobody, you know, this, would, this was a difficult thing for the general population of his time. In the same way that it is hard for many people today who are used to the established traditions to come to grips with this new music. And, and even scholars, you can always talk about in a very meticulous, analytical way. You can ask the composers themselves, what did they try to do? How are exactly are they using this material? But from the point of view of having an opinion about this is great music or this is just good or this shoddy, uh, whether one should even ask those questions is already a question, you know, something uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that is questionable. You just listen. Hopefully you have an open mind. Mm -hmm. You enjoy some of it. You may not like a certain other styles. Uh, the important thing is to try to come back and listen to the same pieces again. Unfortunately, they're not often performed again, because it's only through, as I try to show, in, when I get to new music, to, you know, mm -hmm. since the 1950s, I try to make a, a major point that you ne need to listen to this a piece again and again and again, so that the language, which may be at first very foreign to you, sound dissonant and you know, in, so different from what you have heard all your life, that it becomes part of you, that you feel it, that you're comfortable with it. It's only at that point that if you hear another piece in that style that you won't have such a, you know, a negative or a, a, do a, a window in front of you saying, hey, I, I don't like this stuff. It, it just takes feeling at home with it. And I know that it has happened to me, and I, if I can take a second to say the story. When I, was, uh, when I was going to school, Bartok, who is now considered a classic uh, from just before the World War II, that was so new, that was so difficult, so dissonant, and I, you know, I didn't like it at all. I became a music major. I didn't want to listen to that music. And I forced myself to listen to one piece, the fifth quartet, 14 times before I even realized I had heard this piece before, mm -hmm. and I got comfortable with it. And that taught me a big lesson. You know, mm -hmm. You've got to give it all a chance. Of course, with thousands of people writing music, and talent is, you know, real talent is not widespread. We have to be choosy, and eventually certain names stand out and are doing really original and interesting work. You know, when I was in college at Worcester, uh, the music history professor was an open graduate with a master's mm -hmm. here. And Hindemith was just coming in, yeah. and she just thought this was the worst possible. Oh, my. All you had to do was say his name, and she yes, just had yes. died little death. Yes. <laughs> and he came to Cleveland, I believe it was, to lecture. And yes. she, much to our amazement, she went up there to hear him. And yes. we were just fun. So when she came back, we said, how come, feeling as you did, yes. you uh, made that trip? And her reply was that she wondered, just wanted to know what a man who wrote such horrid music would look like. <laughs> and she said, you know, 
very much like everybody <laughs> like else. Yes, I human. never forgot that. But that she made she was interested enough to yes, yes. go. And, and uh, yeah, let me just tell you, when I was at Yale uh, around 1959-60, Hindemith, who was already an old man who had taught at Yale years before for a few years, came back for a visit, and I sang under him. Oh, did you? Uh, he, he 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 prepared a concert of of choral music, including works by Stravinsky, and I have very seldom stood in front of a man who was more inspiring mm -hmm. and unbelievable ear this man he could he could just pick out every little detail mm -hmm. it was fascinating i think the students here had some similar s situation when stravinsky, when stravinsky came, came and in the 60s. many of them still talk yes. about that have never yes, never exactly. forgotten that exactly. um, i think we really mentioned the electronic music and how you work that in uh, sure i certainly do not uh, 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 avoid it, mm -hmm. uh, and and in areas that I do not know much, like you know the latest things, I I am lucky enough to be able to do this. That there are willing faculty members in the conservatory who I can invite as guest speakers, oh, mm -hmm. and so they've come to these introductory mm -hmm. courses, and and it's just wonderful to have the latest notions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let me ask, see here. Uh, all first year students have to take your course, and you had, you had four, four sections of them, is that right? Two. Two, two sections. Two large sections. Two yes, sections. Yes, and yes. what else did you teach? You taught other things as well. I you? also teach, well, we all teach one or more courses in, in the survey, the next level of On period second, surveys, yes, baroque okay. music. Uh, uh, I, uh, my specialty is the classic period, mm -hmm. in the second half of the 18th century. And is that, are those required to some degree? Uh, so, uh, Depending on what your major is in the conservatory, you have to take two or three such courses. And then, again, depending on the major, uh, some of them require an advanced 300-level course, mm -hmm. which is, again, uh, these are mostly elective courses. They tend to be courses on very individualized subjects, like a composer, like I teach a course on Mozart. Mm -hmm. uh, or they can be opera in the Baroque period. Uh, in fact, this coming semester, uh, Claudia McDonald, one of my colleagues, is going to teach a course in post-World War II American op oh, opera. Oh. Very unusual. Mm -hmm. Have you a favorite uh, composer? Oh, boy. That's a tough one. When people ask me that, I say, that's hard. Because when I listen to Bach's B minor mass, that's my favorite work. Uh -huh. If I listen to the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, nothing can be better. Yeah. But if you would ask Not it to really me, a fair question, if maybe. I had to be put on a desert island, the famous desert island question, and I had to have the complete works of a composer, it would be Wolfgang Mozart. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, well, partially it's the one I know best and I've taught so many years, but I feel that in his music he, he perhaps more than, at least in my opinion, than most composers, covers the gamut of human experience. Mm -hmm. And emotions. And emotions, mm -hmm. and it's all there. Mm -hmm. It's all there, and... Do you have a favorite instrument? Favorite instrument? Well, I studied the piano, and I even studied the oboe for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I mean, I have instrument. I could say the orchestra is okay, my favorite yeah, instrument. The whole business. If I were mm -hmm. starting again, oh, actually, I would have loved to have studied the cello. I love mm -hmm. the sound of the cello. Mm -hmm. But again, my poor vision mm -hmm. is such that when the music <laughs> is out here, I could not see the, the notes. <laughs> well, you sort of alluded to this uh, if you were starting again. If you had your professional life to live over, would you do anything different? What I would have loved is have to have had the opportunities as a boy to do music mm -hmm. more than I had, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that I might have started an instrument earlier, uh, and perhaps if I had had the talent, uh, I know I was musical, but you know to really develop mm -hmm. a talent is mm -hmm. it's, it's something very special. Uh, I would have loved to become a performer. A singer, opera singer. I mean, opera is one of my. Well, if you were doing it a specialties. year and a half, for heaven's sake. I mean, if you were doing it, uh, 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 what are you saying? A year and a half when you were sick? Yes, 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 when I was. Uh, yes, 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 right. Yes, yes, yes. So there's uh, something that I, I've always loved opera, and I've taught mm -hmm. our courses on opera here, too. And sure, I would have loved to have been a great opera singer, mm -hmm. but you know, that's. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, it isn't enough. Mm. That's. Um, 
So you must certainly be looking back, though, with great personal, uh, personal and oh, professional yes. satisfaction. Oh, absolutely. I have had, uh, well, I've had some wonderful colleagues, and mm -hmm. it's been wonderful to work with them in the conservatory and in the college. It's very stimulating. The whole environment of Oberlin is incredibly stimulating. It's a special If you place. love music, yeah. as I do, and I think that that, if I may say so, that is my forte as a teacher, that mm -hmm. my love for music comes across, and I, I hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly, you know, find mm -hmm. it incredibly stimulating. That's my, you know, that, that's my thing. I, can't, I could not live without music. My toes are constantly conducting and moving with music, even when I try to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just part of me, every pore. Uh, is, 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 is that what we call restless leg syndrome? No, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but I, um, so, and of course the, com the students at the conservatory. Yes, as in any school, a great percentage, uh, you know, our, uh, human nature is la lazy. It doesn't always work as hard as it should. Mm -hmm. One always finds excuses. But thank goodness for those wonderful 20%, 25% of the student body that are brilliant and want to study and want to learn and are incredibly stimulating and stimulate us to do our best. And that, that is the great advantage of Oberlin. Mm -hmm. And to have students who are both in the conservatory and incredibly oh, yeah. musical, mm -hmm. as well as the college students. And one of the few conservatories, I imagine, has that kind of a tie Absolutely. Up, yeah. Well, officially, it's the only one. Mm -hmm. There are others in, in Cincinnati. And we'll play with it a little bit. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we like to pat ourselves on the back mm -hmm. as being unique. <laughs> well, as we wind this down, and we're almost done, believe it or not, uh, retirement is now looming, ah, and I hope you enjoy it immensely, uh, as many of us retired are, have and are. Um, are you going to miss teaching? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. The dean has, uh, 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 was not too happy that I told him earlier in the year that I was leaving, uh, and he has said, the door is always open to you if you want to come back for a course or maybe a module, mm -hmm. part of a course. That's wonderful. Uh, at least the door is open. I don't know if I will miss it. I wonder uh, if you take what it. I what I think I will, mi I will not miss is this in incredible stress of daily having to always, you know, I feel I'm a performer every day. Mm -hmm. I have to be ready and, 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 and good at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that stress is nice not to have. And mm -hmm. so I have many other things I would like to do. And may, you know, one of the things is even, am I going to be one willing to continue reading and staying with my field? I think I can't imagine not because mm -hmm. it's been so much part sure. of me. Yeah. I may not do it in quite the, the amount because I have, what I have said is that I, I've said it for years since I was in college, that as soon as I retire, I re begin my education, meaning all the millions of books, or millions, uh, hundreds of books that, the great books that I have never read, you know, classics of literature, mm -hmm. and just so many other things in the world to learn that one never had a chance because you had all these requirements in college. Mm -hmm. I would like to get back to that, whether to do it through auditing courses here or doing, you know, they now have these courses on, on the internet or just on my own and reading a lot of things. Another thing that is uh, an interest of mine, as you know, is, is food. I was going to bring that up. Yes, cooking. 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 Gourmet and, cooking. Well, first of all, my wife is going to go on teaching for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a little bit the idea of a house husband uh, is in, in the works. And so I would like to help her more and do more cooking uh, and try to get back into what has been a hobby. But there has been so little time because mm -hmm. of the, the job pressures to really pursue it in the way I would like. Do you think so I hope I will. Do you think down the line that uh, you would be a guest professor at other universities, colleges that might be in the works? I don't know. I, I'm not so sure. I don't know. The nice thing about retirement is you can sort of just let the things you, happen. You let, you let, let it happen. happen. I, I, really don't, I really don't know how I'm, I am going to to evolve, I, I... You don't have to know. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yes, so let it happen. Oh, the main thing is this, that I have to continue, uh, I, I have to continue a physical exercise. You have to do some exercise for your body to stay mm -hmm. alive and, and, and in good health. And mental exercise. Sure. Well, to challenge yourself always with l l levels of reading that are beyond the daily newspaper and, 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 and watching a lot of the of, to, of the TV, 
uh, and that challenge I hope I will meet. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly wish you all the best, and I know all the people connected with the conservatory who might be maybe listening certainly thank you, uh, as I think they already have and will be continuing yes, to do over the years. Yes, been extremely nice, mm -hmm. both the faculty at, uh, with the dinner and then, and then the students who gave me a special concert, which was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was, it's been very rewarding. Have you decided what you do with all the balloons you got? <laughs> <laughs> I still have them at home with still have yes, them happy them retirement. <laughs> well, that sort of brings us to the close of this wonderful time. Uh, any final comments? Here's your big chance. If you well, I, I would say this. I mean, first of all, music is so important, and I'm talking about great music. Mm -hmm. if, if people are just involved with popular music, that's wonderful. There's a lot to be said for popular music. That's commercial music. Most of that's the mass media, and fine. I would hope that uh, as many young people and older people as can will also try to expand their minds and try to come to grips uh, through some course, education, whatever, just exposure to some of the great works of the past because it gives such pleasure uh, and, and a sense of, you know, it's, it's, it's like reading Shakespeare, it's like reading, like doing, learning anything at a higher level. It makes you a, a, a fuller, richer person. And I would guess that a lot of students you've taught will be doing that who might not otherwise have, have been the so. case. I yes, would hope so. I would hope so. The most wonderful moments have been when I have gone either to Cleveland or even Tanglewood, say, in, in, in the Berkshires at the summer festival, when former students come who are not even music musicians but, but are college students who come to me and say, I would not be here at this concert were it not for the course I took with you. Wonderful. Now, what, what better what compliment yeah. can it be? Well, you deserve a reward, and certainly uh, <laughs> along with the many you've had. So we're going to present you with this Conversations ah. with Lothrop Mug. A wonderful. And, uh, you can sit it as you were being a house husband. You well, can have your absolutely, coffee. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and coffee is one of my passions. <laughs> so there, there it, it is. There it is. Yes, it matches this uh, uh, motif exactly. And we thank you so very, very, very much, much for being our guest. Uh, thank you for tonight. inviting it's been, me. It's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we uh, conclude this season of broadcasts uh, with this interview, and we hope to be back at the last Thursday of September. 2001, after a summer hiatus. And so until then, uh, this is Richard Lothrop saying thank you so much for joining us and good evening.